take your Bibles with me to John 14. John 14, one of my very favorite texts, preached verses 1 through 6. If you're there in your Bible this morning, say amen. amen. Verse number 1 of John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know the way. And you know the way. Uh, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray one more time. Father, we give this time to you. May your word speak, Lord. May your Holy Spirit have free reign in this room. Lord, that you would be exalted and that your word would accomplish what you desire. Lord, speak now. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus in John 13 ended with some bombshell news. He told the disciples that he would be leaving them. He would soon be apart from them. And he went on, he, he told them that he would be leaving him, them through the channel of death. He would die. It, it, no doubt, it, it, it hurt their hearts to hear these words. Rattled their worlds. They loved the Lord. They heard from Jesus that there was a traitor among them the whole time, Judas. Jesus informed them that Peter, their fearless leader among the disciple group, that he would disown him in just a few hours before the sun would rise. Jesus told them in John 13 that Satan was at work against them. And that all of them would fall when they would be tested shortly. They would all fall away and desert him. Could you imagine Jesus just dropping these bombs on them and the morale of the group must have been at an all-time low. Their hearts, as we'll see in a moment, uh, they had heavy, troubled hearts after hearing these revelations from the Lord. But Jesus isn't going to leave them there. Jesus isn't going to leave them in their uncertainty. He would now take the next several chapters to give them encouragement, to give them uh, something that they could hold on to. And how many of you guys have been discouraged and, and you've been in a low point and, and God has come through and encouraged you in some way? Well, this is what he's doing here in our text we're going to see this morning. These men, their hearts were troubled, and Jesus is going to reinforce their faith. He's going to give them what they need so that later on they would be able to fulfill the will of God for their lives. But I want you to see Jesus is going to give them three assurances. Three assurances we're going to look at this morning as he speaks to them in this upper room. First of all, he, he tells them to not let their heart be troubled. Now these words from Jesus were not only encouragement, but they were a command. I've learned this in my life. I have a choice in the matter. When difficulty comes up, when trials uh, rage, when, when the storms are, are, are plowing against my life, I have a choice in the matter. I have a choice whether I'm going to fret and fear and stay depressed and stay in my feelings and stay in depression. I have a choice in the matter or will I choose to believe God? To trust God, to exercise faith. I'm telling you, uh, trials are common to each and every one of us. We all go through times of discouragement. We all will receive news that we would have not chosen to receive. And, and here, these disciples are in the room. The one they love, the one they spend three and a half years ministering with, the one who they'd seen the miracles, the one in all their hope had been put in. Put in. Uh, he was saying to them, I'm going to leave you. And you're going to fail. <laughs> but he's telling to them it's not over. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. And so Jesus is 
telling them, he's commanding them not to stay in their feelings, not to stay in the discouragement, not to stay where they were at at the moment. And I want us to get this because, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of discouraging things that are happening in this country. There's a lot of discouraging things that may be happening in your home life. There's a lot of uh, things that is unsettling. But I want us to be strengthened in the way that God has intended for us to be strengthened, and that's through our faith. We, we are not left to our own in these days. We are not left to our own at, every, at any point. He will never leave or forsake us. So Jesus tells them this. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, as you believe in God the Father, you should believe. You, I am commanding you to believe in me. I want you to get the, the weight of that statement. Jesus is declaring there that he is equal with the Father and that they can place their faith in, in him. So I want you to see the first assurance this morning was that their faith was secure in Him. Hey, if you walked in here this morning and your faith is rested in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I want to tell you, no matter what you face, you are secure in Him. Hey, I can tell you what, your body may be failing you, but it is well with your soul this morning if you know Jesus Christ. Hey, don't you know that this life is just a vapor? This life is so temporal. The trials that we face, they're just but for a moment in the light of what we have before us in eternity. We are His. We belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day, we will be with Him. We will be like Him. I can't wait for that day. So what Jesus is saying to these men, hey, the answer to your troubled heart is faith in me. And the answer to your any issue you're facing this morning, any issue that is troubling your heart, is faith in Jesus Christ. God, I know you will not leave me. I know you will bring me through this. I know that you have my best uh, will uh, at your heart. God, I know I can't understand what you're doing right now, God, but I trust your heart. I trust that you will bring me through this. And what God is looking for is a people who will believe Him, who will have faith that could be tested. Because a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And I want you to understand that, church family, that our faith is usually strengthened in the difficult seasons. You know, expert sailors aren't made in calm seas. I'm going to tell you this. You see, I've seen the strong anointing on some of you guys see it. This, like, I see the strong anointing on some of our worship leaders. If you heard their testimony, you'd know why. God's brought them out of the depths of darkness, depression, suicidal thoughts, demonic attacks. I'm telling you. And from those troubled seas and from those uh, times when God has showed himself to be faithful, he's risen them up and now they could sing the song of ages that worthy is that lamb who was slain because he has won the victory. Has he won the victory in your life? Oh, he's, he, you may not see it yet, but he's fighting on your cause. He, it, the victory might be right around the corner if you haven't experienced it yet. And I just want to encourage somebody today that your faith is secure in Him. So He told these men, the eleven up in the upper room with Him, do not let your heart remain troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. This was a radical call to trust in Jesus. Just as one would trust God the Father. He said, you can trust Me. He promised that he would keep them, that He would bring comfort, that He would help their troubled heart. Here's another declaration from Jesus Himself of being God in the flesh. I want you to see, I read it in the commentary, it said, one who seems a man asks all men to give Him precisely the same faith and confidence that they give to God. Jesus is God. I wanted you to get this this morning. I, I, there's no doctrine that I enjoy preaching more than the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not like the other false gods and the, uh, and the false 
faith systems of the world, he is the Christ, the one and only Son of God, but he is God the Son. I want you to know that in him, Jesus Christ, dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We're going to see in just a moment, uh, Philip is going to say, hey, hey, will you show us the Father? And it's going to give us a little strength in our crawl as we're about to go through these suffering and the difficulty. And Jesus said, have I not been with you so long time that you don't realize that when you see me, you've seen the Father. You guys understand that God is a spirit. Hey, when you get to heaven, you're going to see one on the throne. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let that excite you. You see, that's why the demons and the devils that are in other people try to mock the name of Jesus. They try to come after the name of Jesus more than any other of the false religions because they know that there's power in the one name. There's only one who can say it. There's only one who's on the throne, and it's Jesus. So they're working hard to try to keep people blinded. They're they're working hard to try to deceive people. The devil who deceived them, the Bible says, uh, was cast into the lake of fire. I'm so thankful that the day is coming. His days are numbered, that deceiver. He's going to be cast into a lake of fire, and he will be able to deceive no more. He'll be able to blind no more people. I'm telling you this morning, what we need to get back to is just placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, serving him. When trouble comes, we trust him. I trust you, Lord. I want you to understand when he says believe twice in this context in this in verse number one, they were both in the imperative state. There, he was saying, "This is not an option. This is a command. You you have to believe on me. You have to. I command you to believe. You can place your faith securely in Jesus. You believe in God. Believe also in me." Oh man, as we studied John, we've seen that Jesus is Lord over creation, right? He's walked on water. He's healed the sick without any medicine. I'm telling you, he's raised the dead. (laughs) You think God can deal with your issues? (laughs) He's Lord over all creation. He told the storm on on the sea. Anybody ever been on the ocean? I remember a few years back I was on the ocean in San Diego with a friend of mine. I think I was 18 or 19 years old. and I was on a jet ski. (laughs) And I don't know how he got me out there on the ocean on a jet ski. And I'm riding on a jet ski, and this wave comes. I kid you not. It was about seven feet, I would say eight feet. And I hit this wave, and I came off of this, and I hit the water. I, I felt every vertebrae in my back. I thought I broke my back, my tailbone. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I, I, that day was cut short on the ocean. <laughs> and um, man, just the power of one wave. He commands the seas. <laughs> he knows the number of sand, the Bible says, on the shore. I, I just, I, his, his power is beyond what we can comprehend. He told <laughs> Lazarus and to come from the dead, and he rose up. And I just get tickled when people say, well, can God handle my prodigal? Or can God handle my finances? Can God handle my husband who's a jerk? Can God handle? Yes, he can. And he's looking for people who will exercise faith in the in-between time. These men would go through a lot, and Jesus knew it. He knew that every one of these men, besides John the Beloved, would die martyr's death. John the Beloved, he would be dipped in hot oil and and banished to the island of Patmos. And he would, you you can imagine the pain associated with all, every inch of his skin being burned. But (laughs) these men did not have an easy road ahead of him. And this is why I believe Jesus is going to reinforce their faith, because this side, God has never promised that we will have a bed of roses, this side of eternity. God never said it would be easy. That's that health, wealth, and prosperity junk that isn't found in Scripture. God wants you healthy. God wants you wealthy. That may not be the case. That's a lie. That's, that's a man. That's another gospel. But the truth is, we will endure hardness. 
we will go through seasons of difficulty. We will, we will unfortunately bury loved ones. We will go through sickness. We will go through trials and difficulties. But what he's promised is his presence. His presence is enough. God, I, I might go through this, but just as long as you are with me. God, you might take me through the fire. But just as long as you are with me, God, you might take me to the depths, almost like, like David said, oh, if I make my bed in hell, just as long as you are with me. Anybody with me this morning? I want to be where he is. I wouldn't be in a lap of luxury in Beverly Hills without God. I'd rather be in the center of his will. And there is where you find peace even in the storm. And I want to encourage somebody this morning. Believe on Him. Your faith may be wavering. <laughs> he sent me here this morning to tell you <laughs> He's got you. Oh, this week in the prayer closet, God had to reinforce my faith and He gave me promises. He reminded me of things that He had that had been prophesied over me, things that he promised me from his word, things that, you know, prophetic words and other things and, and from my kids, from my children's children. And I, was, and I was reminded of this this week. And you know what? That, it just put a little extra pep in my step. <laughs> it helped me to get up this morning and to seek him and to get here and to be excited about preaching the word of God and ministering to his people. And I want to encourage us to take the assurance that Jesus, he gave to these that are, that it's applicable to us. Your faith is secure in him. Don't let your heart remain troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I want you to see the second assurance that he gives to these men and to us as well, I believe. He says, their journey is would end in heaven with him. Look at verse number two. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That, I, that where I am, there you may be also. He assures these men, and those who are in Christ, us today, that our journeys will, will, will end in heaven in the Father's house with Him. I love how Jesus speaks of heaven here. He calls it His Father's house. He says there are many mansions. I was thinking about that this week. There's room in heaven for any who come. There's room in heaven. There are many mansions. Now, this week, I kind of have my bubble burst because I, I like to tease you guys and say, you know what, I'm, I'm living for, the, for eternity and, and one, uh, one day I want to have crowns and I want to have a mansion in heaven. <laughs> well, this word here for mansion could be translated a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the ways is just a, a dwelling place. So it isn't necessarily scriptural to believe that there's going to be these you know, slums in heaven, and then there's going to be mansions over here. <laughs> that the less spiritual are going to get, you know, a slum lord type situation, and the, and the more spiritual are going to be on the Rodeo Drive, Beverly Hills, you know, the, 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 the nice areas, right? <laughs> those over here who are less spiritual will live in Lake LA, and those here will be in Quartz Hill. On the <laughs> I'm just messing. I like teas on Lake LA. There's people here who live in Lake LA. I love them. I love Lake LA. Just kidding. <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach us that clearly but what it does teach is that there are many dwelling places permanent residences hey you've ever had to move and change your, 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 your residence your address with the post office and you know it's, that's a process And well in heaven once you get there that's your permanent residence You'll never have to move. I hate moving. We're going to be moving here pretty soon. <laughs> and I hate packing. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You don't realize what you have 
until you, you know, you, you accumulate all this stuff and you got to move it. I've been already going through the kids' room, throwing away stuff and trying to lighten the load, right? And every time they fight about it, they, they haven't played with that toy in a year. But as soon as I say, you know, this is going away, this is, this, they start to cry. You know how it is. And it's just a whole ordeal, right? For weeks. And then you get to your place and then you're unpacking for another few months. And it's like, ah, oh, Lord. But anyhow, when I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, those in Christ, that would be your permanent residence. And it would be pre-prepared. <laughs> you ever moved into a furnished house? Somebody, some rich people in here might know what that feels like. You get movers, and, or you get the front, you know, you just move in and everything's already put, all your stuff organized. But um, in heaven, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare the place for you. Oh, the master builder. On earth, he was a carpenter. He built houses and things. And in heaven, he's building for those who love him. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard what God has in store, what he's preparing for those who love him. Hey, what we have ahead of us is better than what we have now. I want you to know this. And this is what he's promising these men. And for those who are in Christ, he says, I'm going to prepare in my father's house. There are many mansions and I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's going to be a personalized place. God knows what you like. <laughs> He's going to personalize a place for you. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. In my place, there's going to be a full court basketball. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to be right next to Pete Maravich, you know, the, arguably the, one of the best guards. I'm saying, I don't know. But he's preparing a place for us. And I want you to just grasp that this morning. You see, faith gives you the eyes to see the, the, the future. It gives you the, the, the fortitude to face what you're going to face. And this is what he's doing to these men. He's fortifying them, saying, hey, you're going to suffer for my name's sake. Hey, the world's going to hate you, and eventually they're going to kill you. But at the end of all that, I have something better for you. Something that your mind can't comprehend. The Apostle Paul spoke about when he was taken to third heaven. He, now, he said it was a vision. He, he said he didn't really know. He didn't name that it was himself that saw it, but he says, I am not allowed to utter the things that I saw. Think about this, the beauty of even this creation. Uh, we went up to uh, Crowley Lake and, and um, Morgan, where else was the lake? Uh, June Lake a few weeks ago. Absolutely breathtaking, beautiful. And I just was reminded of his glory and creation. But I'm telling you, what heaven is is beyond anything that we can comprehend. I heard about a little girl who was out in the woods, a uh, city girl. She was visiting her grandparents. And, uh, you know, in the city, you don't get to see the stars very much. When we live in LA, the smog and the, you know, the lights everywhere, you don't, you don't see the, the stars as well as you do out in the country. And this little girl was out at night and just observing the glorious uh, constellations and the stars. And, uh, and she looks at her grandpa and she says, if this side of heaven looks this beautiful, what does the other side of heaven look like? And I want you to get this in your, your mind. And some of you, you're looking forward to heaven for a lot of different reasons. And, but I just want you to see the beauty of it this morning. The most important thing, the most beautiful sight that we'll see in heaven is Jesus, though. <laughs> just to be in his presence finally. Oh, he's going to wipe away every tear. See, when John describes heaven in Revelation, he had to describe it, and, and he, he ran out of ways to describe it. He had to describe it in, in what was, would not be in heaven. <laughs> he said in Revelation 21, verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no tears in heaven. He's going to wipe them away. There shall be no more death, no more death, no more, no more goodbyes. I know people who are grieving someone they lost this week, and 
Sometimes all you can do is just hug them, cry with them, and but there'll be no more death in heaven. <laughs> there'll be no more sorrow, no more sadness, y'all. No more disappointment, discouragement. There'll be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. No more pain. No more pain of suffering that we experience here as part of our human experience. And I want you to just set your eyes for a second, your spiritual eyes on heaven. You see, I believe that God allowed Paul to see into third heaven, to see into heaven because of what he would suffer. He would suffer more than any of the other apostles. He'd be stoned. You read, read it. He'd be scourged. He'd be stoned. He'd be in prison. He'd be, every, he'd be snake bitten. He'd be, I mean, everything you can think about. You know, some of us, we, 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 leave a, we leave ministry or we leave a church because someone hurt our feelings. <laughs> what, what, what are we going to say to the, the saints in heaven that went through being thrown in the, to lions in the stadium? <laughs> What are we going to say? I, I, I don't know. That's, maybe that's just how I think. But I think we're going to be holding our heads down when we're, <laughs> when we're next to these, these heroes of the faith. But God allowed Paul to see what was waiting for him. And that's why Paul was able to say in his life, man, for me to die is game. <laughs> mm, I can't wait until God calls me home. You ever been around a person like that? They're ready to go. And sometimes for their loved ones, it's, it's, it's hurtful. <laughs> like, why are you in a rush to get out of here? But if you know, if you have the eyes of faith to know what's waiting on the other end, you are untethered from this world. And I think the problem in, our, in a lot of our Western culture is that we're so wrapped up in this world that we don't want to leave. <laughs> we don't. We, we're going to do everything we can to extend our stay. And I, I think we should take care of our bodies and other things like that, but heaven is going to be better than anything we've ever experienced. I think the good things on this side of eternity is just a foretaste of glory divine. <laughs> Sometimes we feel, we, we feel a little bit of the, what we're going to feel in heaven all the time in this room. When his presence is here, I get the chill bumps thinking about it. When his presence, when you're in his presence, there isn't anything else that's more pressing. There's not, you're not thinking about your to-do list. You're not even thinking about your aches and pains in that moment. He overwhelms us. And for me, you know, <laughs> the tears start, my, the tears just flow. I just, can't hold them back, and it's just like your presence. I love it. And so, heaven is a real place. He's gone to prepare for us. And I want you, Christian, to understand this. Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven, bestseller, New York Times bestseller. See, people are people are wanting to know about what happens after this life. But Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven, he said this for for the Christian. This present life is the closest they will come to hell. For unbelievers, it is the closest they will come to heaven. Let that sink in. Some people are living their best life now. I'm not living my best life now. <laughs> but this is that's a heavy statement. I was reading that book this week and he talked about the Apostle Paul and Nero, the one who had his head cut off. Paul lived for eternity. He lived for a coming kingdom. Nero had his kingdom and his pleasure. And now, uh, Paul lived for the glory of God. Nero lived for his own glory. Paul is in, enjoying everlasting pleasure, everlasting rest. Nero, he's now experiencing everlasting suffering. And I want you to get this picture this morning. For the believer, heaven awaits us. And anything that we suffer here now, 
so difficult, it will pale in comparison to what we will experience when we're with him. So I want to encourage us with that. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, verse number three, to prepare a place for you, I will come again. I love this promise. I believe Jesus here is speaking of his second coming. Not when he, during that time when he showed himself alive 40 days after his resurrection. He, he's talking about coming again to the earth and coming for those who are his. And uh, the disciples would, of course, all go to him in death. They would all precede his return in death, but they look forward to his return. Some of these men believe that he might come in their lifetime. And, and um, I don't know about you, but the more signs that I see, it may be in our lifetime or your children's lifetime when he comes back and, oh, we're setting the stage uh, for his return. We see it happening on a global scale. And so we've got to live with that day in mind when we will either go to see him or he comes for us. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that I will come again and receive you to myself. He's going to come again. And he says, Verse number four, and where I go, you know the way. So Jesus, he gives them this assurance. First one, he says, you can place your faith in me. Your faith is secure with me. The second assurance he gave them was their journey would end in heaven. If I told you that if you went through about a year of difficulty and at the end of that year, you will receive a check for $10 million, what that, that year would seem like you would go through things, but you, you, knew, you knew at the end of that you're going to get this prize. We'd be able to endure. And I want to tell somebody that this morning. You're going to go through hardness. You're going to go through difficulty. But at the end of that is heaven. <laughs> heaven awaits us. Let that strengthen you today. But the last assurance that he gives them is that they would know the way. That they already knew the way. Look at verse number 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus assured these men who had a relationship with him, with him that they knew the way and that he was the way. I want you to, I, I saw this this week, it was very fitting. The quote says, without the way there is no going. Without the truth there is no knowing. Without the life there is no living. Jesus said, I am the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life which thou must hope in. And I want you to get this tonight or this morning. If you are in Christ, you know the way. If you have a relationship with him, you know the truth. If you have believed on him, there is eternal life that you have already received. And I want to encourage somebody here today. You may not have it all together this side of eternity. You may be going through the darkest of trials right now. But if you have Jesus, you have it all. <laughs> you don't have to look anywhere else. Thomas was known for his pessimism and maybe his doubt, doubting. <laughs> but Thomas's question was rooted in the fact that he wanted to be with Jesus, and we don't we don't want to give him a hard time for asking. Jesus said, "You know the way. I am the way." See, the Christian faith is unique in that anyone who comes to Christ, they are received. I love this. I preach an all-inclusive gospel. There is no one beyond the scope of Jesus and His salvation that He freely offered. 
that he purchased with his blood on the cross. There is no one too bad. There is no one who's gone too far. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter how much is in your bank account. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. I'm telling you this morning, he is able to save you if you come to him in faith today. I love, I've seen it. I've seen him save atheists. I've seen him save people out of Islam. I've seen him save people from every walk of life. And he's faithful to do so. John Newton was speaking about three wonders that he would see in heaven. He said, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first wonder will be to see many people to whom I did not expect to see. The second wonder will be to miss many people whom I did expect to see. And the third and greatest wonder of all will be to find that I myself is there. <laughs> I want you to get this this morning. Just, become, just because we come to a church, even like this, doesn't mean that we have a relationship with Jesus. Just because we Maybe we're baptized as a kid just because we know a little bit about the Bible does not mean we have a relationship with Jesus. I, I was thinking about this as I studied for this message. Jesus was the one saying, I know you. I'm preparing a place for you. Now, some people are going to say, Lord, Lord, I, we know you. We served you. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Scary, some of the scariest Verses in in the Bible, and I want to. I don't. I, I I do this because God leads me to do it. Because I truly believe that in the church in America, we have we have. How can I put it? We have neglected to preach the the, the gospel clearly. I want you to hear me out. Salvation is by faith and faith alone. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple decision to trust in Christ. And that's how we come into relationship. But I want you to understand that the Bible gives us a clear view of what that type of faith looks like, what saving faith looks like. Faith that doesn't show up anywhere in our lives. Is it truly saving faith? Faith without works is dead. The Bible says that Abraham was justified by faith, right? How did Abraham's faith work itself out? He, he left everything. He left his home country, and he followed God, and he lived in tents his whole life. That was evidence of a real, genuine faith. Now, I've had to wrestle with this because... You know, I, I've, I've worked and I know we can get to that. It's a thin line. You can, we can try to add to grace or we can cheapen it completely to the point where people have false assurance. And so I want you to just think about it. If my life were on trial to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? I worry for people, Christians, who have no prayer life, no desire to worship, no, no fruit, no conviction in sin. No, I mean, I worry, and I'm not your, I'm not your judge. I'm not your savior. God knows your heart. Like Newton said, there are going to be people who maybe I would have thought, <laughs> they're not. I didn't think they were going to be here, and they be there. And people who I thought, because <laughs> I'm not saying it's not just works, because if it's just worse, if it's just on the outward and your heart is far from them, that won't save you. Works won't justify you. So I want you to get this picture. Jesus knew that these men believed in God. Why? Because they left all. It showed their faith worked itself out in their lives. And I, I think we know that those Christians in China who go to church in, in fear that they might be found out and imprisoned in work camps for 
for years upon years, I think that that's a faith that you can, you can rest on right there. But some today in the modern and in the Western culture, oh, I said, I, I repeated the words that the preacher said, got my fire insurance, and I just went off into living for myself living for the flesh. I I don't know. So I don't know. Like I said, this is something that I'm working through as a preacher because Jesus did make salvation so simple a little child can come and little children do come. And I believe that their faith is genuine and they they don't have any (laughs) pretense about them. They don't have any double-minded, you know, motives and they they come to Christ. So I've seen five-year-olds I've led my couple of my kids to Christ, and I believe that. But I want you to get this picture. Jesus said, "I I know you. I, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. We have a relationship, and I want to ask you the question: Do you have a relationship with God? Is He real in your life? Does He affect your life? Does He does?" In some way, does your faith come out in how you live, how you serve? God, he, he, <laughs> He's looking for true worshipers, those who will worship Him in spirit and truth. And the truth is, <laughs> if you're going to be, how can I say it? If you're going to follow after Christ, if you're going to be his disciple, it's going to cost us something. So he gave those three assurances that they would know the way, that their faith is secure in him, and that their journey would end in heaven. And if you're here this morning without a relationship with Christ, I want to urge you today to open your heart to him, to believe on him. The Bible talks about the need of repentance. You turn away from the direction that you're going and you turn to Christ and you acknowledge, Lord, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I am asking you to save me, to give me eternal life in heaven. I'm trusting in you, Jesus, in you alone. And the Bible says when a heart does that in faith, when a person receives Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they are sealed with his spirit, they are given eternal life at that moment. They're not, they're not working for their salvation. I want you guys to get that. I don't want to confuse anybody. We don't work for our salvation. When we receive salvation, we work it out. <laughs> I work for God because I love God. Because he saved my wretched soul that was on its way to hell. That's why I serve. I'm not preaching this sermon just so God will give me a few stars on my chart so I can get to heaven. No. I am preaching from a position of relationship. I love him, and so I want others to come to know him. I want to tell people, see, one of the true signs of someone who's been saved is a desire to see other people saved. And I always worry when there's Christians who never witness, who never desire to tell other people about Jesus. Hey, there's something wrong there. So if you need this morning to come to Christ, come to Christ. Call on his name. It's that simple. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other name given among men, given under heaven. There's only one name that can save you, the only one. It's Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. See, there's a lot of religions that teach you can, some other way you can get to God through the baptismal waters, through working in the church, going on a mission, through good works they try to teach you, through meditation, through whatever you want to fill in the blank with. But Jesus said, it's only through me. And I want you to get that this morning. 